Yes. Ready? Okay. Yes. All right. Today's a short day, though, too, since we start a little bit late. But it's an easy day today. So today we're going to talk about Ephesians chapter 2. But before we go into that, just a little review from last time. Ephesians chapter 1, I kind of talked about three different things. The first was Greco-Roman letters. And the second was essentially dividing up chapter 1 into two parts, spiritual blessings and Paul's prayer. So just to begin our review, remember I talked about Greco-Roman letters and 1 through 2 here in Ephesians clues us in uh, to the nature of Greco-Roman letters and also Pauline letters. If you remember, we looked at Corinthians and Romans and Philemon and and Timothy, and they all have a particular formula. There's an opening, and we're going to talk about the thanksgiving and the prayer uh, more specifically today. But you have this opening that's standard. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a standard letter opening. And also, more importantly, the reason I wanted to go through this thing about letters is so we can understand the nature of our text. Remember, author, text, audience. What is our text? It's a letter from Paul to the Ephesians. So it's a letter from people to people. And the reason for me that this is important, I remember one time I went over to a buddy of mine's house and he was copying Bible verses for his son to memorize. So he had his son memorizing Bible verses. And one of the verses was 1 Corinthians. So I was just curious. And I asked him, what is 1 Corinthians? And he couldn't tell me what it was specifically. And what does it do, this 1 Corinthians? And he couldn't tell me what it did. So do you understand... For me, I'm very displeased because here we have a Christian who's teaching his child the Bible, but without any real idea of what it is. What is this text we're studying? And for me, it's important to know because when we're called on to make a defense, we should be able to articulate our faith reasonably, intelligently. So it, it's more than just simple knowledge for me. It's this connection between all those Christians that have come before us and back to Paul himself. This is a letter from a person called Paul whose influence is really incalculable. Think about the influence that this one single person has had on world history. And here we have letters from this person, personal letters in some cases. So it's just a special thing to know the text we're talking about, what it is. And also I showed, I read to you a letter from Appian, a Roman soldier, to his father. And I hope that you could detect some similarities. Appian wished to receive a letter from his father in his own handwriting. And we spoke about the significance, the meaning, the import of, of handwriting, especially when you're a soldier. Again, I can remember all those mail calls uh, when I was in the Army, when I was in Iraq. We would run to mail call, hoping to get a letter, and when they didn't call your name, it was like, oh, man, no mail today. We wanted that mail. We wanted to see that handwriting because it, it, it connects you with a person in a way. And hopefully that you saw some, some connections between Appian's letter to his father and some of the letters of Paul. Appian said that he's sending a picture of himself to his father. Paul writes that he is sending, sending news via Tychias to the Ephesians so that they might know how, how they are. So you see these little personal connections and I hope that that parallel kind of just really drove that home for you, that these are personal letters written by people to people. 
and everything that goes along with that also. We talked about the opening. Again, there's two parts to chapter one of Ephesians, spiritual blessings in Christ, and I'm just going to follow the, NR, the NRSV subheadings. It, it works well. So the first part of chapter one, spiritual blessings in Christ. So this is a blessing discourse similar to the Hebrew Barakah. So it's a blessing formula. Now I want you to note a couple things. Just the first sentence, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who? And then it lists a series of things that God has done. God destined, God chose, God made a plan. All these things that God has done. All right, so blessed be the God of our, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who? And then compare this with 1 Kings 8, 14 through 15. Then the king turned around, and this is Solomon. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel. While all the assembly of Israel stood, he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who? And then proceeds to list all these things that the God of Israel has done. Fulfilled promises, David. I mean, all these phrases and things are, are just important thematic moments in Israel's history. The day that I brought you out of Egypt, this is huge in itself. Remember the day the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt with an outstretched arm, with mighty hand, with signs and wonders. This is repeated throughout the Old Testament. And it is a testament to the God of Israel's power and sovereignty and grace. I have chosen a city, Jerusalem, tribes of Israel, 12, in which to build a house, temple, that my name might be there. And again, David, Israel, David. And you can see, like, scattered throughout this blessing, this barakah, David and Israel stand out to me. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, then again David, then Israel again, then Israel again, then David, then Israel again, then David, then Israel again. So you can see this is, this is common to Barakah. It's a celebration of what the Lord God has done. The difference in Ephesians is that Paul has included Jesus Christ within this blessing formula. So it's not only the things that God, do, that God had done, like destined, like choosing, but also the things that happen in Christ. So it's a blessings discourse, similar to the Old Testament. Now remember those discussions about Paul and Judaism that we had in Martin Luther. Was Paul, did Paul throw Judaism out with the bathwater, essentially? We're going to talk a little bit more about this today and bring home some of that uh, new perspective on Paul stuff that we talked about in theory. Today we're going to see it in practice. But if you're going to say that Paul threw Judaism out with the bathwater, essentially, then why does Paul begin something like Ephesians with a barakah, with a traditional Jewish blessing that includes Christ? I don't think that Judaism went with the bathwater we see these elements of Paul's Jewishness in his writing. Next, within this first part, and there's a lot within this first 14 verses, um, but in this section right here, we talked about the imminence of God, how God functions in the world. Is God transcendent or imminent? And we, when we looked at this passage, this pericope right here, if you see all the things that indicate the action of God, he chose, he destined, the good pleasure of his will, he freely bestowed, the mystery of his will, good pleasure, plan. And then you see it kind of builds for me, it's, it's like a literary thing, but it's little pieces and little pieces and little pieces, but then at the end you get this big grand sentence that puts it all together. So it's like a building. We'll see this in the second part in Paul's prayer also. 
having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. If I were to use the word superlative, does that make sense for everybody? The sign <laughs> she was about to raise her hand. Superlative. All right. So, adjectives. Let's take an adjective like great. Great. It's great. How's ice cream? It's great. You put ER on the end to great, and it becomes greater. This ice cream is much greater than that ice cream. So that's called the comparative. So you got the normal adjective, you add ER to the end of it, greater, that's the comparative. But now add EST on the end of great. Greatest. Great, greater, greatest. So great is the naked adjective just by itself. Greater is the comparative. Greatest is the superlative. It's expressed in the most magnificent language possible, in the grandest possible way that you could express it, it's expressed in the superlative. So here you have what seemed, to, for me at least, you have naked statements and then put together at the end with this grand superlative sentence. You have scattered power, will, destined, but then at the end, in the superlative, it's expressed. And the superlative is 11C, is that the superlative? Yes, yes, yes. This sentence right here. That kind of puts all this, all these others, into this one sentence. And then it expresses it in superlative terms. So you can't express it any more superlatively than it's expressed here. Does that make sense? Now, within this framework, we also talked about Calvinism and meta narrative. And so it's not simply about theory. I wanted to drive this home today. It's about practice also. So, this is a Dutch, the website from a Dutch Reformed primary secondary school system. Now, pay attention to this bottom paragraph, especially. I'm going to try here. We see the three forms of unity as summaries of the core of the Bible. Now, I, I get tricked up on these words. Namely, these are, we see these are, help me with this, these three words. By this we mean the Heidelberg Catechism the Council of Dort, and the Netherlands Confession. I'm assuming that's a variation of the Belgium Confession. But these three forms of unity are for this organization, which is an uber-conservative, I'm guessing, Dutch reform or organization. The three forms of, universe, uh, of unity are the essence of the gospel. And by the way, these, this is the essence of Calvinism, these three things. These are the, this is the essence of Calvinism. So they say it is the summary of the core of the gospel. So you can see how this is a meta-narrative. You have this meta-narrative and everything else falls underneath it. Everything else is beholding to that meta narrative. Unless you're a Wesleyan, you have your own Armenian meta narrative, of course, that might have three different things here. Again, I, I, tulip is a big thing for Calvinists. I walked into a Wesleyan seminary and they said, we don't believe in any of that. But this is how biblical texts are used to support meta narratives. Because the Calvinists, and I'm not saying anybody, I'm not saying the Calvinists are wrong. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it is what it is. It is what it is. They derive these meta narratives, this way of interpreting the texts, from the text itself, 
And I think we acknowledged here that, in, at least in this section, God is superlatively imminent. God is imminent. And I think the next section clues in on that as well. Then we talked about in Christ. And I gave you the Greek here just so you can see the ends. In, in, in Christ, in him, in him, in which, in Christ, in the beloved one. And I'm going to say another grammar word, dative. If I say dative, does that make sense to everybody? The dative case. Dative is like the case of the indirect object. I give ice cream to you or location or time. We'll get into it. But we also discuss that in Christ is probably locative, meaning location. We are in Christ, meaning in relationship. But there are other ways of expressing that through, by, the means of. But in Christ as a primary theme of the letter to the Ephesians. Next was Paul's prayer. That's section 15 through 23. And I wanted to clue, uh, clue you in on other elements of, of letters also here. I didn't get a chance to do it last time. So in 15 and 16, we see a thanksgiving. I do not cease to give thanks. And then secondly, a prayer of intercession. These are also common elements, and let's see some. All right, the letter to the Romans. We saw the opening, right? Grace to you and peace from God our Father. But again, in Romans, you have this opening thanksgiving. I thank my God. And then this intercession, so that I might share spiritual gifts, that we might be mutually encouraged. I might come and reap some harvest. All right, so thanksgiving, introduction, thanksgiving, prayer of intercession. All right, these are all elements of Pauline letters. Look at Corinthians. Again, the opening, Paul, an apostle, grace to you and peace from God our Father. I give thanks to my God always. And then again, what's the prayer so that you are not lacking in any spiritual grip? Again, intercession. So opening, thanksgiving, intercession. Again, Philemon, opening. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving. When I remember in, you, my, in my prayers, I always thank my God. And then the intercession. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Again, opening, thanksgiving, intercession. Now it's different when you go to Galatians. Galatians is one of my favorite letters um, because there's none of that in Galatians. If you know Galatians, Paul's pretty angry. He's not happy at all. All right, so there's no thanksgiving. There's no intercession. He goes straight into, I'm astonished at you Galatians. <laughs> Like he just skips and goes right. These are letters from people to people. You can see Paul, the person here, he's angry. He, ha he don't have time for Thanksgiving or intercessions. <laughs> All right. It's time to get right down to business. People to people. And then this last part which I'll get to, it's actually, this part's going to deal with unity right here, which is something, which is next, a big topic for next week. I needed to get through two before I could talk about unity. But I'm going to come back to this last part and just leave it for now. But in this, also in this second, second section, more eminence. Only this time it's not planning and devising and, and choosing, it's actually action. It's power. And again, if I may, you have greatness of his power, working of his great power. God put this power to work 
square. Okay. And then again, another superlative sentence where he puts it all together in this one long strain. So you've got little elements of power and then again, this superlative, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but, at, but also in the age to come. So it's hard to express power in a more superlative way. So it's in the superlative. Also, remember here the emperor. We've talked about the emperor a lot. Whenever you hear things like this, rule and authority and power and dominion, we're talking, we've talked, we haven't, we haven't talked about it, but Paul has talked about the spiritual powers and principalities in Paul's cosmology. Cosmology is, our, is how we perceive the universe in a spiritual sense. So for Paul, the cosmology of Ephesians is earth, air, heavenly places. That's Paul's cosmology, how the universe is formed and shaped. And Christ is above all of that, both earth, both air, and heavenly places. Did you, I, I, am I the only one that heard Ephesians in one of our songs today? Did anybody else? Huh? Shame for shame, shame. Or the, it was the, I believe it was the second song, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry holy, all creation cries holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. That's a hymn. From whence did that hymn derive its theology? Bam. The name above all names. When you sing these hymns, people get these lyrics from someplace, right? And so when I heard that, I was like, bam, that's Ephesians. I'm going to talk about that today. <laughs> and then this last part, again, and he had put all things under his feet, made him head over the church, which is his body. For me, this, this cycles into unity which is a major theme we're going to touch on. Um, but I just wanted to get through two first because two kind of helps with the unity. So just hold off on this until next week. Uh, outside of that, any questions from, from chapter one or anything generally? Comments or concerns, thoughts? I'd really love to have a good argument. <laughs> That's what we're missing. I don't know enough. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you and somebody else then? I, you know? <laughs> we're, all, we're all good tracking? Give us some time. Give us some time. Time? I'm sure we can think of something. I think it was very helpful that you summarized what you discussed last week. Mm. And I can follow the whole train of thought. Yeah. It's not that you're not losing it. I just go from this, 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 and I think yes, 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 yes. So I'm all in. I'm, 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 I'm oh, nice. I'm nice. I don't pick up or don't understand. Or, nice. So your summary really helps. Nice. Uh, yeah. And it might help us, uh, help me also with my quiet time, and I'm going to read a letter. Yes. And that's my hope. Hopefully you'll go back and read the letter and maybe when you hit some of these verses, you'll say, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, and maybe it'll resonate for you. And, and in, especially in application to your own lives, you know, maybe something, I can't be all to all, but I hope that some of this you can make use of. It'll be fruitful for you, hopefully. I think you're also saying that because he follows the writing style of his day it makes these letters even more authentic yes yeah. yes i think in the first uh, evening you talked about that the oldest manuscripts are from 200 from 200 a.d a little yes they are between 150 and 200 ish they think so they never found a manuscript from uh, 
Like the real one. No, they, no, and you know, so we don't have the original letter to the Ephesians. No. Or we don't have the original anything. And I'm, I'm kind of glad we do. Can you imagine what we would do if somebody found the original copy of Matthew? Uh, yeah, I, and don't, we would, there's a lot of people that would make probably an idol yeah. of, this manu, of this text, this manuscript. Um, so I can't help but see the New Testament has been so well preserved, yet we don't have the originals. For me, that's providential. I don't think that we can handle the originals. I think we would make idols of them. Look, we, look, we make idols out of pinky bones and big toes and <laughs> locks of hair. Do you know, I mean, like the saint's relics. Like, like, seriously. This is the pinky finger of Saint Agnes of Sicilian, who, you, you know, and... Imagine what we would do with, the, with an original manuscript. And is it not true that uh, Christianity is the most preserved and well-documented religion when it comes to uh, everything that happened? Because I, we all believe in that Julius Caesar lived. Yes. Because there are some manuscripts. Yes. But is it not true with the New Testament that the uh, evidence is overwhelming? Yes. It's far more than any of the classics far more than any Greco-Roman classic. There are more texts of the new, reliable and ancient texts of the New Testament than there are of any Greco-Roman work, by far. By far. I mean, uh, history. Oh, history. Yes. Historic uh, figures. Yes. yes. So uh, Arabs in the Middle Ages had to, had to translate Aristotle, for example. It was virtually lost. Without Arab scholars in the Middle Ages, we would have lost Aristotle. That we were in no danger of ever losing the New Testament. And when was that written, for example? Aristotle? Yeah. After, about 700 uh, BC? After that, after 700 BC. Yes. Huh? No, wait. I mean, uh, this was written, the New Testament or uh, the letters, the, the manuscripts. Oh, was, first century. Yeah. So that's much more reliable than what has been written about Aristotle. Yes, well, and, and just the sheer fact of the matter is that we have a continuous line of evidence from the, the original text, which we don't have, of Aristotle, for example. And I'm, I said 700, I, that's, that's off, I'm sorry, 400-ish, 400 or 500-ish. So why, why do you think so many people don't believe, like I said, oh, but the, the Bible is just about story tales? They don't believe it's true. Well, uh, as far as our history or evidence, it's mm. super reliable, right? And, and not believing people believe that. I mean, they, they see it as a book that is, has an immense value historically, yes. philosophically. Yes, yes. Why do you think that the, the people reject it so much as in a valuable book or truth? I think modern people have problems with supernatural, ultimately. I, I'm not saying that a, a, an atheist can't believe that these are actual texts written by actual historical people. Uh, but that's one thing, believing that Christ stilled the waters as something else. Believing what's in the texts is different from acknowledging the reality of the texts. So I can acknowledge the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita I can acknowledge these as historical manuscripts, but do I read the Quran for ultimate truth and for spiritual guidance? No. I would, I'm not, a, you know, I don't know, I'm not, an, I'm not a, a non-believer, so I can't speak to perspectives. Yeah, but also um, because the Quran was yes. written way after. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. But if you are a scientist or a start to study all these letters and the origin of Christianity, even if you, if you come at it with a reasonably open mind, uh, you would probably, you could come to, the, to faith because of it, because it, it is so clear. And mm. I, I heard about this um, atheist detective or police detective or whatever, and when he he says when he's at, at a scene, a criminal scene, the first thing is to 
No, it's, it's actually, there's a book called Four Gospels, One Jesus by Paul Ochtemeyer. It's really great for that. There are four Gospels, but one Jesus. Yeah. The Gospels are told from different perspectives. They were written by people with perspective. Matthew is the most Jewish of Gospels. Luke is, a, is, is, is more Gentile. Mark is short and sweet and to the point with a lot of Hebrew Greek. Luke is elevated in a literary style that, that rivals the, the Greco-Roman literary letters. And also John. John is unique in his theological outlook. I could do a class on the gospel too. There are also, so Matthew's the human face. Uh, Luke is the ox. Mark is the eagle. Oh, I forget, I'd have to go back and do this. But each of the, throughout Christian history, each of the Gospels has been assigned like a personification. Um, dang. What is Mark? And then John's the eagle. Mark's the lion. Because he always goes leaping here and fro. If you read Mark, it's immediately. And then immediately you went this. And then immediately. You know, so it, he's leaping here and fro. And, and so anyway, so the Gospels have character in and of themselves. Yeah. Anything else? What, what was it that uh, stood out in the first letter to you personally the most? What that? What stood out or spoke to you pers on a personal level to you in the first letter the, mo the most? In the first chapter? Yeah, I mean first chapter. I'm battling. I've always, ever since I attended a Wesleyan seminary, I'm battling between where I stand on Wesley and Wesleyanism, Calvinism, Armenianism, eminence, transcendence. It's really nice to claim total depravity because, you, you know, there's a certain freedom in, in that, in that Calvinist view of total depravity because I know I'm going to sin. There's nothing I can do about it. So when I do, just relax. You know, you're... But then if you're more Wesleyan, and this is why Catholics have this guilt thing because Catholics are more on the Armenian side. And so guilt is a typical Catholic thing because they feel they have the ability to resist sin. And so when you do sin, the guilt is even that much palatable and tangible. So I don't, you know, these things. They're, they're on the Armenian side also. So if Calvinists believe in total depravity, human beings are unable not to sin. Wesleyans believe in Christian perfectionism human beings are able not to sin. So these are two men in there, you know, they're diametrically opposed to one another. Which is right, which is wrong. I don't know. I've said that before. I don't know. That's my favorite saying. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. He always addresses, let's say, the calling of believers saints. Yes. Who sins? Yeah. <laughs> saints who sin. Saints who sin. Look. In Romans, he says that he wants to do good, but he doesn't do good. Can't. Yeah. Because he's called. So he, yeah. Yes. So we we sin. Yes. We, we, I don't believe we sin. You don't believe in Christian You don't believe in Christian perfectionism? <laughs> Man, come on. Look, I'm... <laughs> Wait till, wait till I get going. Then. No. But, but didn't he also um, believe, I'm not sure whether he said that uh, you can lose your salvation. Yes, and that's another thing. Perseverance of the saints. Yeah. That's in There's TULIP. Total depravity, unlimited election. Mm -hmm. um, oh, man. Limited atonement. Limited atonement. Yeah. 
irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. So perseverance of the saints, once you're in the palm of God, there's nothing that can remove, remove you. For the Wesleyans, maybe there might not be anything that can remove you from that palm, but you can certainly jump out of it. Yes. But don't you think that it, it's really interesting? But um, I think the most important thing, the question for us is, but even when we study this, um, I mean, um, with all respect to Kelvin, the, 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 the Dutch guy, Armenian, it's still man made conceptions. Yes. Yeah. So does it really matter? Yeah. We get, oh, I'm not this or I'm not that. And I'm thinking, you know, what does the word say? Why do we make it so complicated? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're preaching in the choir. Remember, I said, I'm not dogmatic. And this is why I'm not dogmatic. This, this is why. But for those people at the Dray Star, or whatever the name of the school was, yeah. the Dray Star School, it most certainly absolutely does matter. You're not getting anywhere near those kids unless you sub subscribe to the three forms of unity. You're not getting anywhere, anywhere near them. Care about is the the what is that the Trinity? <laughs> <laughs> well, what are they talking about? Yeah, hey, I don't know. It's not a gospel in itself. A little gospel, I mean, it maybe. It's great, and I'm sure it, it needs help, but it, it, it narrows it narrow people, and I think Jesus came to liberate us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you believe, for example, in the perseverance of the saints, that is a wonderful, wonderful, comforting. Mm piece of theology. Yes. And if you are, don't believe it, if you think that Christians can actually get lost again, you're really denying every, the, the whole work that God did, because God gave you new word, God protected, God, everything that God did can be lost again, because you can, you know, so it's, it's a major doctrine, really. Mm -hmm. Which one? The perseverance of the saints. That's, are you, can you remain in that palm? Once saved, always saved. Thank you. Uh, unless you quench the Holy Spirit, because yeah. there's no forgiveness. Well, yeah. then you would be a backslidden Christian, but you're not lost. Yeah, can you backslide? Is backsliding equal to jumping out? Uh, you know, these are all questions bound up in these. In <laughs> yeah, these. And we make it. And it becomes man-made because it's still we have to just read the word. I think. I mean, it's, I think it's also natural. Yeah, as a child. As a child, yeah. It's, yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's natural <laughs> to want to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. think, like you say, I don't know, it's like <coughs> it count or something. It's too much. It's a fair fun haven. But it doesn't mean we need to be uh, ignorant at the no, same no, time. No. Yeah. And hopefully, if anything else, I've, this has helped you to see where these things, how they're applied, and from, from where they come. So, so it's not just theory in our head, this application of interpretation. When you jump out of this hand, you got hold. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Problem solved. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, Gosh, they, we got you said that the, the Catholics, they, they say the guild, right? And they... Uh, and they are more to the other side. They're more on the Armenian side. That's why you ever heard of this phrase, Catholic guilt? No. 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 Guilt's a big thing. But because they know they've sinned. They know they're able to resist sin. And that's why they go to confession, to relieve themselves of this guilt, to confess their sins. But don't we all do that all the time? And we feel like, hey, we have to repent, we have to change something? Mm -hmm. Some of us, I would, I would think, yeah. But it's just more so, you know, on the total depravity side, it's not as effective, I don't think. Um, I'm not burdened by all day, because if I am, I'd be burdened all day. You know, I've sinned five times since we started this class. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> up here, you know, it, so, we can be, our own sin become, can become a chain that we are burdened by and drag around with us everywhere. And the Catholics also believe that they have to 
do something to remove to get forgiveness. Yeah, to get to yeah. get to get to give to yeah. get to forgiveness. And so this is more on the works, free will side they're doing rather than simply receiving. But we're going to, there's something in here today, though, that throws a, a, a wrench in the, in, the, in the wheel again. So we got to go, guys. Or it's like almost seven now. <laughs> End of lesson? <laughs> Y'all want to call it? No, okay. All right. So, all right, uh, quickly then. Uh, chapter two, again, two parts. I did it by the NRSV, the subheadings. From death to life, one in Christ. And so, Geraldine, I did this specifically for you. <laughs> because you asked, what does in Christ mean for me? Now, we're talking about big, broad theological ideas. And one through three, remember, is part of the theological side and not the practical side. But I think here we start to see what it does mean. And I'm going to teach you a little Greek, too, hopefully, if you'll let me. All right, this section. You were dead through the trespasses and sin in which you once lived. And this is two through... 2, 1 through 10. Now, a little bit about translations also. So this is the NRSV that I have on the left. Now, I'm going to go through the Greek word for word. And you, plural, so yuli, and yuli being dead in the trespasses and in the sins your. These are articles. Toys, taste. In Dutch, you have articles. Duh, het. The thing with Greek is that case is embedded within the article. So if I was going to say, I'm going to my house, I would say, ik gaan naar mijn huis. You think, thank you. All right. Nar is a preposition. It's used in that dative case, indicating to somewhere. I'm going to somewhere. If I was coming, I'd use the genitive case. Ik kom van mein Haus. I'm coming from my house. So dative indicates to something, just like nar. But here the two... The dative is embedded within the articles. So the in of in Christ is embedded within those two direct articles. So, but look, through the trespasses and sins, you remember we talked about your translations doing this with the article in. How does it make sense of it? If we look at another translation... The NASB 95, you see, and you are dead in your trespasses and sins versus you are dead through the trespasses and sins. The NSB is, is a more literal one. So it's going to use in and in. Now I want you to notice two words. Well, one word used two times. Necrus, necrus. Dead dead. And look what comes in between. We've talked about in Christ, in Christ, in the beloved one, in him, in whom. But now it switches. You were dead in trespasses and sins. This use of the in again, in which you once walked following the ruler or the authority of the air of the spirit which is now working in the sons of disobedience. In them also we once all lived in the desires of our flesh. 
So, we have an opposite to in Christ. We have in our desires, in our trespasses, in our sin, in our flesh. Not in Christ, in trespasses, sins. And what's, again, notice what the bracket is. Dead. Dead. And everything, the end that comes in between. Trespasses, sin, lust, flesh, death. But notice the parallel. Now, instead of dead and dead, alive and created, and everything that comes in between, in Christ, in Christ. And it's right here just a little bit after, but still, in Christ. We all serve a master, whether we like it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not whether we know it or not, we all serve a master. You either serve a master of death, living in death, or you serve a master of life, living in life. And so what in Christ means is transformation from the dead person who lived in flesh, in trespasses, in sin, in lust to one who is alive and created anew in Christ. Does that make sense? Do you see how, do you, is it just me or do you see these parallels? I mean these, these brackets, dead, dead and everything in between, created alive and everything in between and the two in opposition to one another. So everyone, everyone is dead, spiritually dead, this dead claims, unless you are in Christ, you become spiritually alive. Yes. Yes. The text can't, can't be more clear. Dead and dead. And in between dead and dead, in trespasses, sins, guilt, lust, shame, flesh. But in Christ... Kindness, grace, grace, gift. But why then, if you are in Christ, do you still sin and do still those things from the flesh? I don't know. <laughs> That's a broader theological topic that I'm prepared to answer today. Oh, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> let me, let me go. It seems like in Christ, those things are put to death. And of course, that's what, what Paul says, but I still do those things. And that's mm -hmm. why... I come back to, so we are then saints, we are saved, in Christ we are saved, we zijn geborgen, we zijn veilig, hoe zeg je dat? But it doesn't, um, if we still have, we still human beings. Yes. Blood. So it doesn't mean that those things that is in that letter up, even though spiritually we are, we are uh, made new, yeah. our um, yeah. natural selves is still wrestling with those things, basically. Yes. Just to be sure that, because it seems like, oh, now we're in Christ, I mean, we don't have any of that, but the truth is that as a Christian, unfortunately, we still fall. Yes, yes, yes. And also remember, it's also about status before God. God is a holy God who cannot tolerate unholiness and will visit injustice, sin, with justice. In that dead state, you're getting justice. When you, when you have your quiet time, do you always go through scriptures like this? Like, uh, debt collects a debt, and that is an adjective, and this is a comportment. <laughs> Sometimes I just read, and I you know, let my mind go somewhere else, and I think, Oh yeah, I know that one. Uh, created in Christ Jesus, good works. Oh, thank you, Lord. And then I pray about it a little bit, and then I go somewhere else. <laughs> but uh, you analyze the whole thing, or is, mm. don't you do this in your quiet? Well, no. This is what I'm supposed to be doing for you guys is analyzing. I'm talking about your person. In my quiet time, no. In my quiet time, I. Mm.
I just try and read, but sometimes, sometimes I, without me wanting to, I was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. That's just what I do, you know. You can't help yourself. Yeah, I can't help it. Um, secondly, good on that though, understand? Is that made clear enough? It, it's just striking to me, the dead and the dead, and what's in between, and then the alive and the alive created, and then what's in between. It's a dichotomy, two opposites. You can't see the grace. These are, this is an important word, charis, grace, you have been saved, grace, grace, gift. So I can't go into it too much today. I'll give you a book, Paul and the Gift by John Barclay. So this word grace was used, charis and gift were used within Greco-Roman benefaction. You open the prayer today, Geraldine. I'm using Geraldine a lot today. But I, like I'm hearing the stuff you said just connected with my lesson because you opened your prayer with, um, you're our savior king. You are our provider. You might as well have said you are our great benefactor because that's who God is, our great benefactor who bestowed a gift onto us which was totally undeserved. And so what John Barclay does is, is examine this language of gift and benefaction and deserving. He's another person out of the new perspective. Um, but it's just important to recognize this language and to know that it was a gift given without deserving so. But, and this is a whole nother debate, works and grace, how much are we, you know, faith without works is dead, as James would say. You're justified by faith, not works. So how do works and faith coincide? Um, I would simply say, yes, by grace you have been saved. Riches of his grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works. Right? So this is our standard justification by faith, not works. But, read the last little bit of the pericope. Remember that <laughs> covenantal gnomism. I said that word a couple weeks ago. That was how the new perspective on Paulers saw Judaism. Uh, Jews did the law not to earn their way into the covenant, but to keep in the covenant as a demonstration of what being a covenant member is. That's why you did the things you did. So for us, although we do not earn our way in Christ. That does not mean that there is nothing expected from us. Because it's too simply to sit on our cheap, I use this phrase, cheap grace to you. And that's the definition of cheap grace. I've been saved. Now I'm good. And I can just chill and live my life the way I want to live it and never do anything. And I'm good. Well, that's cheap grace. And that's not biblical grace. Biblical grace expects something. Even though it wasn't earned, okay, that's great. You can sit on that and hold it dear to your heart. It's not earned. Okay, I gotcha. But it expects something. Just like benefactors expected something. Our great benefactor in exchange for the gift of grace expects something. Anything? One small question. Yes. The, the titles of the, the different alineas, um, paragraphs. Yes. Subtitles? Uh, yes. Are, are they uh, from the original text? Or? No. 
negative. So, yeah, the, so these are the, the subtitles of the new revised standard version. And it's just easier because different commentators will have different divisions. I've got two commentaries that, for example, place the last 10 verses of one actually in two. And so it's just easier to do thought units for this kind of class. And I think the NRSV does a good job of breaking up into thought units. Yes. The good works from verse 10 and 11. Um, I always read it that the good works were already uh, uh, made, made ready by God Himself and put on our way so that we could see them and we could do them. And then it, it, uh, these are the good uh, works which. Uh, which are um, good for us. Yes. Which we do with pleasure. Yes. That are suitable for us. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. Boy, that's real God eminence right there. That pre even preparing good works specifically for us. Yes. You know, and, and, and but uh, wouldn't that be how God works? We're each touched by our own particular thing, you know, I, I, I was reached in a certain way that might not have worked for other people, and so, yeah. And that is, it's easy for us, and it's not really our work, mm -hmm. it's, it's God's work, mm -hmm. and we are, uh, we are doing it. Mm -hmm. It's in the last sentence. Mm -hmm. Do you think you can still say no, though? Can you say no to doing that work? I'm going to just take the day off <laughs> today. Can I say no when God asks me, yes. me something? Yes. No, I can't say yeah. no. Yeah. There you go. That's a good answer. I say the same thing about my wife. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's better safe than sorry. Happy wife. Happy wife. Good. Okay. <clears throat> now, do you remember also I talked about boundary markers? Um, what the New Perspective saw Paul criticizing. Not necessarily the Old Testament, not necessarily Torah, not necessarily Judaism, but those boundary markers that kept Israel separate from the nations. All right, so in this second part of chapter 2, uh, 11 to 22, of course, again, there's a lot there. I can't cover everything. But I just wanted to show you the practical implications of this theoretical discussion that we had on the new perspective. And here it is in the text. Note, remember at one time you were called Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision. So note the topic that distinguishes Gentiles by birth and the people of God. It's circumcision. It's not necessarily the law, even though, and this is where it becomes tough, you got 15, he has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances. But note, and, and here's the thing, you were called Gentiles by birth, the uncircumcision, by those who call themselves the circumcision. So you Gentiles were called uncircumcision by Jewish people. Now, note, though, however, that instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, note what that meant. Even though that this physical circumstance is made by human hands in the flesh, when they were called the uncircumcision, mm -hmm. they were at that time aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. While they were called the uncircumcision, they were strangers to the covenant of promise. While they were called the uncircumcision, they were in the world with no hope and know God. So on the one hand, he's, do you see on the one hand, he's, he's kind of dismissing 
circumcision as an identity marker. But he's not throwing out Judaism. He's, saying, he's reinforcing the commonwealth of Israel, that national status of Israel or that concept of Israel. The covenants of promise in the world without hope and without God. So while you were Gentiles, you were without all of those things because you were uncircumcised. So he's criticizing circumcision and he's criticizing those who, 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 who criticize others for being uncircumcised. What he is not doing is criticizing Judaism. In fact, it's the opposite. He's saying, while you were Gentiles, while you were Gentiles, you were aliens and strangers without hope and without God. So I'm just trying to bring home that discussion we had about Paul and the law, Paul and Judaism. And you see what has happened, but now, bam, and again, that major theme, in Christ, in his flesh, made both groups into one. Breaking down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. Between who? Jews and Gentiles. The dividing wall separated Jew and Gentile. If you were on this side of the wall with the Jews, you were citizens and fellow members and you had hope and God. If you were a Gentile and on this side of the wall, you had no hope, no God, no citizenship, no promise. But what separated the two were these identity markers, circumcision being foremost among them. And you see he leads the paragraph off with that, but then proceeds to reinforce ancient notions of Judaism right after it. So how can you say that Paul has thrown out the law when he's clearly here talking about commonwealth, covenants, promise. And so now, in Christ, now that that dividing wall has been broken that separates Jew and Gentile, Gentiles by birth, who were once called uncircumcision, instead of being aliens, you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are citizens with the saints built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Holy temple, the Jerusalem temple. It's clear what he's referring to. But it's a spiritual temple now. So this is what the new perspective people are saying. They're saying if you read Paul, you can see he's criticizing something. What is it that he's criticizing specifically? It's those things which separated Jew and Gentile, which alienated Gentiles from the covenants, from the promises. And that here in Ephesians, we see that this breaking down of the wall is the bringing of these two people groups together into one. Clear? Kind of clear? Last thing, and then we're done. I'm sorry, I won't use yellow again. <clears throat> For he is our peace in place of the two, thus making peace, thus putting to death the hostility through it. Putting to death the hostility through it, you can might as well use a synonym, pacify. He pacified. Peace to you who are far, and peace to you who were near. Does anybody remember me talking about the peace of the emperor? The Jewish historian Philo, Philo spoke of this wonderful benefactor, Augustus, benefactor, of his wonderful rule, and that Augustus reduced disorder to order and restored peace 
and thus became the first and greatest universal benefactor. The Roman historian Velius writes of Augustus, There is no gift that humans can desire of the gods or the gods grant to humans, no conceivable wish or blessing which Augustus on his return to Rome did not bestow, but first and foremost, peace. Ovid calls Caesar a man of peace, and Strabo complained, proclaimed, the Romans and their allies never enjoyed such peace as exists under Caesar Augustus. Remember, Christ and Christianity is in competition with the world and the rulers of this world. Remember back to death. You serve a master whether you know it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, whether you like it or not. Do you serve Caesar or Christ? Caesar is going to bring you a lot of peace and a lot of stuff. It's nice and shiny, right? But what is, remember those two words, death, death, and life. Caesar, the powers of this world in our own age, or Christ. Anything? The sum we're done. That's chapter two. It's funny. I I was once talking to an atheist, and I, so he didn't believe in God or in, in Christ. What do you believe in? He's your master. And I, but then I think he the question came up. But do you believe then in a devil? And he did believe in a devil. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, because you look around you and you see evil all around you. Mm. So, but because you didn't believe in God, mm. you couldn't blame God for that. Mm. So you had to believe in the devil. Mm. That's a strange philosophical place to be in. What happens after you die? <laughs> see, there's nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask that question. Anything else? Confusion? Mass confusion? Yeah? Nay? Okay. Mass clarity? Okay. All right. Thanks. Chapter 3 next week. Thank you, guys. Totes